2013 and passed in 2014. In that agreement, like I said, we consistently increased our stake. GMPC had a 10% free carried interest, a 15% participation interest, and then we constituted a company known as Esploco to do commercial investment and eventually through technological transfer, they would then become the anchor for the nation in terms of exploration and production. And so Esploco had 24% of the remaining 75%. When you do the competition and add them, it means that the state had about 43%. Soon as the Akufuado government assumed office, even against technical advice, against advice from the then minister, Boachia Jacob, immediately he was dismissed. Mr. Peter Amewu commenced renegotiation with AGM and Ake. Following that re renegotiation, when they came to parliament, it turned out that of the 43% that we had, they had reduced the 43 to 18%. And so, like I said, we started from 13.6, we went to 15, we went to 20, and then 43. This government assumes office, and they reduced that 43 to 18%. Indeed, we took a stand against that. And in parliament, the majority had no option than to agree with us that, look, this agreement ought to be looked at. And so in granting approval, Parliament directed the minister to go and renegotiate and increase our stake, especially the additional interest from 3 to 10%. The minister was given six months to report to Parliament. After the seed month, the minister came to Parliament. And to our surprise, he had not only refused or failed to increase our stake, he had further granted concessions one of the concessions was that, in that agreement, if Ake had a problem with securing licenses like environmental permits, our minister is compelled to take that up, pursue that, and get them all the options and the permits that they need. So in effect, what our minister of energy is being turned into is a guru boy for Ake to go around doing their bids and carrying their errands from them. We also gave them concessions that they wouldn't pay withholding tax. Even the technology that would be used in producing the oil, that technology, the minister must approve that. In that agreement, the minister states that Ake can proceed with that technology without referring to the minister. Ladies and gentlemen, I hold the view that just like the Mytilenius one, just like the PDA scandal, and just like the current scandal region involving the flying away of about 500 excavators, we decided to investigate this matter. And to our surprise, one month before the agreement was laid, a company was being formed. That company is known as Quad Petroleum Limited. That company has been given 5% of the stake that was reduced from the Ghana share. A one-month company in this sector, you require a lot of experience. So the question is, who owns that quad company? Who are the beneficial owners of quad company? What role did a one-month-old company play such that something that the whole nation is getting just about 18%, just one single company in one month? will be getting 5% of that agreement. Ladies and gentlemen, a lot has gone wrong and continue to go wrong in Ghana's energy sector and Nana Kufado. It has gotten to the point that whenever we see a joint memorandum from the Honorable Minister of Finance and Energy, we are filled with trepidation, especially as Ghanaians are yet to recover from the PDA scandal from the Ameri scandal and from the Bost scandal. And in all these scandals, you would see a consistent pattern. With ECG, you had PDS operating there. With the Bost scandal, you had Movimpina operating there. With the other scandals, you see companies. And just like I said, you see Quad also operating here. And so whenever they tell you they are reviewing a project or agreement, be sure and be looking out for a new company be looking out for a private company. This is a resource 
that must benefit the whole nation. This is a resource that must benefit Ghana, and not just a few. But what we are witnessing under the Akufuado regime is that instead of serving the entire nation, a selected few, a cabal, a clique, is constituted itself into a group. And any time there's a review of an agreement, they attempt to get a stake there and to hold it into the foreseeable future. Ladies and gentlemen, before we left office, BOSS had been retooled and recapitalized. Today, as I speak to you, and I dare the minister to challenge this, BOSS had no single strategic stock in the reserves. What it means is that instead of having about eight weeks to 12 weeks of strategic reserve, today, if we go to any unforeseen occurrences, it means that this country is going to go without fuel. It means that we are going to have a major, major problem as a country. This should be of concern to all of us. How come BOS has no strategic reserves? TOR is equally moribund. You recall that the chief executive of TOR was compelled to resign just because they wanted him to sign an agreement that was not in the interest of this country. And so he had to pay the ultimate price. Ladies and gentlemen, today GMPC, which was our flagship company, which was doing very, very well, has borrowed close to $1 billion today. And out of that $1 billion, they have failed to come to parliament for approval. And let me sign a word of caution to those managing GMPC. Please take note that what you are doing infringes the Public Financial Management Act. And that on the 7th of December, 2021, when His Excellency John Mahama assumes office. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let me state it clearly that on the 7th of December, when we vote for President Mahama, let me state it clearly, on the 7th of December, when we vote for President Mahama, and he assumes office on the 7th of January, 2021, every infraction ought to be accounted for in accordance with law. And so they should take steps. This is a country that belongs to all of us. When we get leadership and we are appointed into such sensitive positions, it's not just about what we benefit. It's about what we think of in the future. I've said that there are two kinds of leaders today, a visionary one, a sober one, a quiet one, who thinks of Ghana tomorrow into the future, and a very loud, robust one who makes a lot of noise but does very little for us. That is what we face as a country. And like I said, the investments we made, if the current administration had sustained that path and continue on those programs and projects, Ghana would have been moving forward than we are today. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't end there. The Ghana Gas Company, built at a cost of $1 billion, despite all the savings that I'm talking about, today is indebted to the tune of about $1 billion. If you add what ECG is adding to it, and you do the analysis, within three years in the energy sector alone, you are talking of a debt of about 15 billion cities. And that is not part of the national debt. There's been a deliberate and consistent approach to take all these figures of the national accounting system. And so they present to you a certain figure as our national debt. But when you look at the contingency liabilities, the contingent liabilities, they are very, very serious. And these are revenues that when we get, we used to pay. And GMPC's loan, they have collateralized our royalties from some of our oil fields. And so what it means is that they're taking the money today, but tomorrow, you and I, the future generation, we would have to pay for the iniquities and the sins of the Akufuado government. Ladies and gentlemen, Ghanaians voted for President Akufuado because he promised to tackle corruption head on. Indeed, he raised the expectations of Ghanaians and promised categorically not to run a family and friends government. Today, you and I are living witnesses that he has proven to be the complete opposite of what we preached in opposition. Corruption, chronism, and favoritism 
has become the order of the day under this administration. Simply put, I ask a football. That is the state of Ghana's energy sector today. It's important, and I like it. Yesterday, I listened to Dr. Baumia in Kumasi, and he decided that he would do some comparison. We welcome that comparison. Indeed, we want them to bring that on, because we hold a superior record head to head pound for pound, eyeball to eyeball, when it comes to NDC and MPP. There is a popular saying, there's a very popular saying, that unto whom much is given, much is expected. But this is not the adage under President Akufuado. President Akufuado will go down in history as the luckiest president in Ghana, and I'll prove that. The luckiest in terms of revenues and resources. But certainly, he would go down as a president who has done very, very little for this country when it comes to substance and issues that affect your lives. If you look at petroleum receipts, President Mahama received 6.4 billion CDs in his whole four year. President Akufuado, by the end of this year, will be receiving over 20 billion CDs in petroleum revenues. If you look at energy sector levies, and this is a levy the MPP described as obnoxious. This is a levy the pre MPP promised that on assumption of office, they will scrap that levy. President Muhammad took a bold decision. It was an election year. He could have thought of the election and decided, look, I will wait. Let me win the elections before I introduce it. But sometimes leaders must make decisions in the interest of the state. And not just because of politics. You might win politically, you might win elections, but when your conscience is clear that the decision you are taking is in the interest of that country, you must be bold, take that decision, and one day you'll be vindicated. President Muhammad received only three billion of energy sector levies. President Akufuado is receiving 12 billion of these energy sector levies. Not only have they retained it, they have increased the levies on petroleum, They've increased the levies on diesel, they've increased the levies on gas, and increased the levies on petrol. And so when the BDCs are paid through the energy sector levies, instead of giving credit to the man who dreamt about it, who conceived it, who pioneered it, they rather want to take credit for where they did not sow. And yesterday I saw them parading it all over. I think that the time has come for us to be honest the time has come for politicians to state the truth and be honest to the people of Ghana. Because politics can also be about the truth. Like I said, if you look at total revenues, and I decided to do three years, three years, if you look at the budget, President Mahama received 71 billion cities in the three years. President Akufuado has received 141 billion cities in three years. And so you can see the little that President Muhammad did, got in terms of revenues and the whooping amounts that President Akufuado got and compare the two to see who has done better given the circumstance that they find themselves in. Due to these huge petroleum increases, and if you look at the 2018 budget, Ghana had a surplus in terms of the exports of petroleum and the imports of more than $1 billion. And so the finance minister quickly comes to parliament. He announced that, look, we've done so well. The trade balance is improved. It is now positive. But when you look at the trade balance, you clearly see that it's on account of petroleum. You just don't look at the trade balance. Go and look at the current account. And you see a huge negative with the current account. Because the current account tells you precisely what you get, not just the raw figures of the export. And so Dr. Baumia can decide that he will do statistical galamsey and give you figures on only trade, but wouldn't deal with the current account. And it is the same when you go and look at the reserves. Like I said, because of the Heritage Fund and the other funds, the gross reserves would always go up. Because every year, you keep adding money to the Heritage Fund. And the Heritage Fund is part of the gross international reserves. But where you ought to be looking at is the net international reserves. 
Any serious economist will not just look at the gross international reserves. Because gross means that there are other things there. When you net them off, then you get the actual net international reserves. That tells you whether you are doing well as a country or not. And that's about all these huge revenues. Clearly, you can see that we are not achieving what we ought to achieve. And so the critical question to ask is that how has President Mahama spent the monies that he got? And how is President Akufuado spending the money that he is getting? And it's important to look at some of this comparison. Now, if you look at the PIAC report, the PIAC report makes it clear that there's a lack of transparency and accountability within the oil sector in terms of accounting for our revenues. For instance, during President Mohammed's time, we followed the Public Financial Management Act and spent a chunk of that money on physical infrastructure projects that comes under capital projects. But under Akufuado, they are spending less than 50% of petroleum resources on capital expenditure. Equally, the PIAC report of 2017 and 2018, and this is a public document, states categorically that $655 million, not cities, cannot be accounted for between 2017 and 2018. What it means is that $655 million of the taxpayers' money has vanished into thin air. This is unfortunate. We've raised this on the floor. The leader has led us. We've demanded answers. And yet, this government is evasive when it comes to this. I hope that they can show you some table on how we have spent in terms of capital expenditure. If you look at President Mohammed's period over the four years, on average, we spend about 4% of our expenditure in terms of a ratio to GDP on capital expenditure. If you look at President Akufuado's record, he is hovering around 1.6%. And so if you don't spend on capital expenditure, and you decide that you want to spend only on goods and services, initially, because maybe you capture the size of GDP and the growth rate through the expenditure approach, you might be seeing some increments. But that is not sustainable. In economics, you just don't look at growth. You are looking at sustainable growth, meaningful growth, that translates into improving the living conditions of the ordinary Ghanaian. And so it's very easy to expand the CPI, add new variables, and come out with some low figures in terms of the rate of inflation. But the question is that, does that affect the man on the street? When you go to the market within the year, can you tell that on the average, the prices increase by just 7%? We all buy items. We know how the prices are rising. And so I think that the time has come to be very objective. And like I said, if you look at the screen, from 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, that is President Mohammed's record in terms of how much he spent as a percentage on capital expenditure. Then 2017, and there's always a lack, because when you hand over, it takes time for the new government to settle in. So if you want to see the real policy effects of the Akufuado administration, begin to look at 2018 and 2019. So you see that 2017 was 3.1. It dropped to 1.6. And it dropped further to 1.5. That is how much we are spending on capital expenditure. And in any growth model, anybody who's done a little bit of economics, whether solo growth model, whatever growth model you take, Capital expenditure is a major component because that is what determines how you are developing as a country. And so this is where we are, ladies and gentlemen. When you do this, what will be the resultant effect? And the next slide tells you, I've done some comparison between 2016 and 2019 so that we know where we are. Because when you spend more, on capital expenditure, and the other person decides that he will spend more on goods and services. It will begin to show at a point in time. And so when you look at the table, you would realize that our debt level, that is the debt to GDP, not just the nominal debt, the debt to GDP, has moved from about 56% to 
to now 62.25% as a percentage of GDP. Yesterday, Dr. Baumia was in Kumasi telling us that their debt to GDP is better than us. You inherit a 56%, you raise it to 62.25%, and you have the audacity and the effrontery to stand in the two force Kumasi and tell the people of Ghana that your track record is better than that of John Mahama. I am not surprised, because if the MVP is capable of turning a very fine heart surgeon into a galamsey kingpin, they can equally. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if the NPP is able to turn a very fine heart surgeon, a very good man, into a galamsey kingpin, they can equally turn an economist into a crack propagandist who engages in galamsey when it comes to statistical issues. Because it doesn't support the fact. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking about inflation. And I tell you, go and read the Minister of Finance's statement. And all these figures I'm churning out, I decided that I won't use our figures. Let's use the figures coming from the statistical service, from the ministry itself, from the Bank of Ghana, from PIAC, and from the agencies. I challenge you, the media, and this for me is important. We must settle the debt stock by the time we're leaving office. Because the Auditor General has the mandate to validate the figures. The Auditor General has vetted, validated the figures, and stated that the debt stock was 120 billion. Dr. Baumia and Kenneth Foretta insist that they won't use that figure. They will use their own figure of 122 billion. And when they appeared before Parliament, and Honorable Aveji asked them why they were using 22, the Deputy Minister, the lady, Abna, stated clearly that when they were preparing the budget in March, they decided to use the debt in dollars, 2016 December, but they used the exchange rate of March 2017. What kind of economic analysis is this? So you can't even trust them. And I think that media stations like Joy FM, you do a lot of fact checking. Let us settle this debate and know Ghana's true debt stock as of December 2016. Because the 56% is even quoting, is inaccurate. And yet, even with that 56, today our debt has moved from 120 to 222 billion. What we accumulated over the eight years, the MPP administration in three years has surpassed that mark. If you check that average to Ghanaians today, a population of about 27 million, it means that every Ghanaian today is indebted to the tune of 8,333 cities today. That is how every Ghanaian owes in Ghana. And yet there's nothing to show for that. The construction sector is key. Because every country, if you don't pour brick and mortar, if you don't pour concrete, you are not building your economy. In 2016, we're growing at 8%. Today, the construction sector that employs the bulk of the youth is growing at negative percent. Negative, not even 1%. The electricity sector, we're increasing access to electricity at a rate of 4% per annum. We picked electricity from 54 and took it to about 84 by the time we're leaving office. And I could follow today, the electricity sector, access is growing at 0.5%. He can't even achieve 1%. If you look at the financial sector, that is where they claim they've done whatever cleanup. The financial sector was growing at about 14%. Today, it's growing at about 12%. And all these are figures contained in Ken Oforiate's 2020 budget. If you go and read even the budget statement of 2017, and I refer to paragraph 90, he states clearly that the CD depreciated by about 9% to the dollar in 2016 and appreciated against the pound sterling. That is what he says. Today, if you go and read his own budget and the Monetary Policy Committee report of the Bank of Ghana, the CD is depreciating at about 13%. And so you take over from President Mahama at a rate of 9%. You have depreciated this year at a rate of 13%. And you still look into the eyes of Ghanaians and tell them that you have slowed the rate of depreciation. Can you slow the rate of depreciation from 9 to 13? It's only in Dr. Baumia's economics 
that you slow the rate of depreciation from nine. You are 13. And still, you want to tell Ghanaians that you are slowing the rate of depreciation. Then we prefer our nine under President Mahama. Because that's where you took over. If you look at most of the educators, they just doesn't, they don't support the argument that the MPP is portraying. But it's important to deal with some issues. He spoke extensively about the energy sector yesterday and challenged us that if we have any evidence, he welcomes that evidence. And like I said, we have taken that on and we will demonstrate to Dr. Baumia that you cannot just engage in statistical propaganda and expect that the people of Ghana will swallow it. He makes a categorical claim that they ended doom so. He makes that categorical claim. And so I've been trying to get somebody or that evidence to show. And God being so great when I was doing the research, no less a person than Dr. Bahamia himself. Dr. Bahamia, on the 7th of March, 2016, when President Mahama boldly declared that we've had enough capacity now, we've dealt with the fuel issues with Ghana gas, and so we were stable and we're no more facing them. So he quickly rushed to Joy FM. And this is what he said at Joy FM. He said that President Muhammad deserves no credit for fixing Dumso, and that it is the NDC that caused Dumso. So if we have fixed the problem, Ghanaians should not even commend us. It had to take a lot of work. And I know the sleepless nights President Mahama and his ministers went through to ensure that this problem is resolved comprehensively. Because you can just pretend and bring in some toy machines, but you must look at the long-term vision of the country. And so after saying this, our vice president, and the job of a vice president with the greatest of respect, is an honorable one. He goes to Kumasi and contradicts himself, not even any other person. No. He contradicts himself and says that they resolve Dumso. In any case, it's not for the vice president or myself to even declare whether Dumso is over. There are statutory bodies like Gritco, like the Energy Commission, they determine whether Dumso is over or not. And they advise that having achieved that redundancy and that level of capacity, we had enough. And so there was no load shed. And so you cannot turn the clock of time. The other issue is that he makes a bold statement that for the first time in the history of this country, it is only the MPP that has reduced electricity tariffs. And, he, and you see, yesterday, if you watch him, he makes that statement and he laughs a lot. <laughs> I watched him. I watched the vice president. Anytime he makes this and peddles this falsehood, then he turns around and laughs. So something came to mind. Is this man thinking that we are not serious as a country or what? Because you cannot say this and then turn around and laugh at us at the same time. At least if you are lying to us, be a little bit serious so that we may think that you are serious. And I entreat you to watch the video again. I have the reckoner, and it's the reckoner that tells you how much you pay. The yellow one is July 2016. The white one is October 2019. Check the prices. Check the 150, check the 100, and check the 300. In July, we reduce electricity tariffs. I do recall that Parkwesi and Misata. I remember in July 2016, May he so rest in peace, chaired that meeting. I do recall that minority leader was then Minister for Labor. He sat in that meeting. We computed the issues, came out with a realignment, and reduced tariffs to close to about 20%. Today, I am stating on authority that the tariffs are far higher than they inherited. And so what Dr. Baumia said, the facts does not support that. And facts are facts. You can have an opinion about President Mahama. I have no problem with that. But you can't have an opinion and have your own facts, your own set of facts, from the generally accepted facts. Because facts are sacrosanct. And this is the reckoner. We will make that available to you, members of the press. And please question them that in 2016, I used to pay 88 
today I'm paying like 96. And you tell me that, look, you are putting monies in my pocket. How do you put monies in people's pockets? By taking money out of their pockets. It cannot be. It cannot be. And I think that we should get serious as a nation. He also makes a statement in respect. He makes a statement in respect of capacity charges. And this is a serious matter for me. The electricity company of Ghana submitted their latest report to us. They deal with dependable capacity. Anybody who talks to you about installed capacity doesn't understand the sector. Because you have to declare availability before you even talk of excess. If the power is not available for dispatch, what excess are you talking of? And so if you have a broken car and one on the road, and you want to budget for fuel for the month, do you budget for a broken car? You budget for the car that is running. And so they don't even understand it. Let them check in 2017. When we had load shading under President Kufo, we had excess capacity of 700 megawatts in terms of installed capacity. And so if you have a hydro dam rated at 1,000 or 1,020, and the dam level can only generate like 300 megawatts, and you insist that you have 1,000 megawatts in terms of installed capacity, and so it's a problem of fuel, it's a problem of money, that is why we are in doing so. It tells me that you don't understand the sector, and that is why they are struggling because when you pedal falsehood and you come into office, the first thing you do is that when you get to the gate at Jubilee House, please put down the cloak of falsehood, get serious with the people of Ghana, and then be honest with the people of Ghana. But when you carry that cloak of falsehood into office, and you think that by peddling falsehood about your opponent, you will succeed, I bet you the people of Ghana will punish you on the 7th of December. And I know that given this track record, every discerning Ghanaian, every Ghanaian who cares about this nation, every Ghanaian who wants this country to move forward should be concerned and must vote these people out because their track record is nothing to write home about. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, like I said, they told us that there was excess capacity and even increased taxes they went and borrowed $500 million. And we're watching them. In 2017, they formed another company, this time known as Stratcon Energy. Stratcon Energy today delivers most of our petroleum products. First of all, petroleum product or petrol or diesel or LCO is a pass-through, so it has nothing to do with capacity charges. And because of the deregulation that we implemented, we are dealing with all the forest losses. Do you know what they did? They paid Stratcon Energy 300 million cities out of that money under the guise of capacity charges. And so when Kenoforata came to parliament, quoting Matthew 14, 13 to 21, <laughs> about how Jesus Christ fed 5,000 people with loaves of bread and two fishes, he was clandestinely paying five people within his system huge sums of money. And he quotes the Bible all the time. That is the state of Ghana for you. Very soft talking, unassuming, but when he picks pen and paper, he can be deadly like a cobra. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, like I said, I did a bit of work just following what I listened to Dr. Baumia. They have what they call flagship programs. And they've made a lot of propaganda about that. They promised you that they will build one district, one factory. Even after assuming office, President Akufuado indicated that he stands by his words and that he would deliver the factories. I just spoke to the ranking member. I challenged the Akufuado administration to name just 15 15 or 10 of the factories that they have built. We are not talking of factories that you repaint, rebrand, and then capture them as one district, one factory. Adam, the President Mama has built so many factories. This is a president who built a cement factory. This is a president who built a rice processing factory. This is a president who built a cashew processing factory. 
There's a president who built a mango processing factory. Not repainting factories, claiming them, and publishing them as yours. And I challenge them. Please, let's inquire of them. We're told that they will build one dam in each village. Not dug out, dam. I come from the Yapi Kosovo constituency. Please, all of you, you are in your various constituencies in the north. Have they built dams in your factory, in your villages? Have you received any dam in your villages? And God is so wonderful. You can't cheat nature. Just this month, a lot of people are coming with pictures of those dugouts that are drying up and can't even get water for their cattle. Not to talk of irrigation. Today, the agriculture sector is declined to about 2.4%. They said they had a flagship program, planting for food, invested a lot of money. When the MPP invests, the outturn rather tends to be low. Under normal circumstances, the more you invest, the more you ought to what? Benefit. But under the MPP, it's always diminishing marginal return. They add one, and it leads to negative. That is a major problem. Dr. Bomia says that he is a Muslim. And he proudly says that he loved the Zongus. That is why they established the Zongo Development Fund. I have done an analysis, a tracking 2017, 2018, and 2019. And if you check how much they spent on capital expenditure, 2017 was zero. 2018 was zero. 2019 was seven million. So over the past three years, what they have spent on infrastructure to lift the people of the Zongos out of poverty, the whole Ghana, out of the over 2,000 so-called Zongo communities that they say they have, is seven million city. The rest is all into chop chop. That is the state of the Zongos. And so if you drive to the Zongos today, you won't see anything different. You go to the Zongos. They just go and then they repair somebody's toilet, one seater toilet. And most of our media is all over with the media inspecting one toilet. <laughs> that is the problem we have. I, I just can't understand these people. They told you that they will give you one million per constituency every year. And so in Yape Kosovo, we are expecting $4 million. I have checked 2017, 2018, when I checked the total releases. Because in Parliament, when you come, we scrutinize you. There's one thing making a budgetary provision, there's another releasing those funds. And so I brought the books, they are here. You can bring three of them. I have compiled all the various so called priority projects from 2017. 2018 and 2019. And if you can do the photocopy, I will share that with you. We have them here. For instance, this is a compilation of reports for 2020. This 2020, I've been tracking that. This is a compilation of the report for 2018. This whole document, this parliamentary report. If you check one million per constituency, at the end of 2018, instead of every constituency receiving $2 million, every constituency received $46,000. That is less than 5% of what you were promised. That's the state of deception that we find ourselves in. That is the real issue that we find ourselves in. And I'm challenging them. Let them come forward and tell us how much they have released. If you look at the medium term expenditure framework and you look at the budget outturns, you would see the figures there. How much you released. It's even worse when it comes to capital expenditure. Virtually nothing. They spend most of the money running their offices, paying salaries, and not doing the actual work. And yet you've established so called development zones. I'm not surprised that the bicycles are sadder that were acquired under our administration, suddenly have developed wings and have flown out. The president doesn't want to comment on that. 400 tricycles, do you know what that can do? 
and just allow your party apparatchiks to just take it. Today, the energy sector levies is being mismanaged. Go to the various landing beaches. The fishermen are crying. Because any time premis goes, the committees are made up of MPP party executives. They end up selling the fuel at the fuel dump. And you, the unsuspecting Ghanaian, you go to the fuel station thinking that you are buying quality fuel. Unknown to you, they are giving you adulterated fuel. And so President Mahama has stated clearly that on assumption of office, we will reform the premier secretariat, put competent people there, the fishermen will be in charge, and they would administer how the petroleum products are dispersed to their own people. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, despite this abysmal performance, the MPP still insists that they want four more years for Nana. Four more years for what? Does the MPP and President Akufuado think that we are here to celebrate mediocrity? Is our president really talking about four more years? I do not think that Ghanaians want to extend their hardship and suffering, given the opportunity to cut it short on the 7th of December 2020. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, last week I met a friend of mine, and he said, Gina, but why are you people trying to come to office? These guys have already run down the system. They've borrowed so much, they've achieved very little, and when you come to office, you are really going to struggle. I looked at him and gave him an answer. And it was a simple answer. If these guys can run down the economy this way in three, four years, if you give them another four years, your guess is good as mine. And so it's a national call. It's not just to NDC members. It's to you, the ordinary Ghanaian who is suffering. It's to you, the ordinary Ghanaian who cannot make ends meet. It's to you, the ordinary Ghanaian, who when you wake up every morning, you don't even have hope. The time to change the MPP government is this year and no other year. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are developing our manifesto. And in due course, the manifesto will spell out what we intend doing. We are also developing policy documents for the various sector. And the energy group has been working very hard. Because like President Mahama said, when he assumes office, the very first day, he wants to see action. Not the one who says he's in a hurry, and yet all he does. <laughs> no. Ladies and gentlemen, the next NDC government would ensure that the objective of universal access to electricity is achieved within the shortest possible time. Our vision was to achieve universal access to electricity by 2020, and we're on course. The MPP government has reviewed it and taken it to 2030. And I tell you, they cannot achieve it because they don't know how to go about that. Let me also assure you that we shall work to improve the transmission system. Under President Mama, we retooled Gridco, got them a facility from France so we can export power to Burkina. Three years now, that program has been stagnating. We would resuscitate that program, restore it, change our lines from 161 to 330 kV, so that we can export power to our neighboring countries and get in some foreign exchange. I maintain that our excess capacity is a result of laziness, is a result because this government doesn't have a foresight and a vision, and that if we were in power, we would have utilized those capacities and ensured that the nation develops and makes progress. Ladies and gentlemen, if you drive through Accra today, Accra is very, very dark. That is why we came up with a street lighting levy as part of the component within the energy sector levy. We shall leverage the street lighting levy and make not just Accra, not just Accra, but the entire country must be illuminated for security reasons, for tourism, and for income generation. We did it. Because under Dr. Donko, we switched from high sodium to LED lights. 
that reduces the consumption by about 60 percent and so we know what we are talking about we have done it before we know what it takes we would make your billing system easier but we pioneered it with the new remitters you could receive a text message every day of how much you are consuming we launched a lot of initiatives and even the app i hear president dr bamia says that the app that we pioneered he wants to recommission that app again i think on the 18th of 18th of april or so so it's just about taking president Muhammad's projects repackage them repaint them and then recommission them as if they are projects of the mpp like i said we would bring transparency within the premix fuel we would ensure that we continue to increase Ghana's stake in the oil sector we would ensure that we continue to empower local companies indigenous companies that are qualified to assume the commandant heights of our petroleum sector because if we manage the petroleum sector well if we do what is proper this country would certainly benefit from the petroleum resource and we know what we're talking about ladies and gentlemen we shall ensure that we restore talk and talk workers if you are listening we procure the two million barrels we shall retool you and ensure that you produce crude from our domestic crude because our crude can be processed in ghana this notion that our crude cannot be processed is not true we tried it it worked and so when we assume office we shall do that we would ensure that bust is equally functioning vibrant and serving you well we have stated that this is not the end of the program this is just a series and this is just the maiden one within the energy sector and its impact on the economy in subsequent days we shall come out with further areas and deal with other sectors i want to thank all of you I want to thank His Excellency, the next President of the Republic of Ghana, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama. I want to thank our indefatigable chairman. I want to thank the minority leader for his leadership and his telling performance in Parliament. But more importantly, let me single out our National Communications Officer, because I know how tireless he has worked to ensure that we bring this program through. We shall continue to be accessible. We shall continue to serve you. The NDC is a social democratic party. And I tell you, don't allow the MPP to tell you they have the men. I am confident that even when you look at the energy sector, the men we have are unmatched when it comes to the energy sector and several other sectors. The NDC has the men. We shall deliver. We shall win this election and serve the people of Ghana with humility and integrity. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable John Abdullahi Jinapur. Shall we please put our hands together for him once again? Well, um, Sometimes, sometimes people contradict um, others. Um, but it's, it's a different thing when you contradict um, yourself and at a high level. I don't know whether after this presentation, people can still say it is still a matter of boot for chalote. It appears those who are even talking about boots are barefooted. Anyway. Um, let me... Once again, thank particularly the CSOs that are here, as well as all of you, and in particular, acknowledge Dr. Jerry Monfat, Global Strategy Management Consultant, as well as um, Mensah Thompson, Executive Director of ASEPA. As we go along, we'll continue to do I'd like to know what a republic administered by the National Democratic Congress would do differently, distinctly, to attract investment into our oil sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a third person. Okay. Yes, madam, please proceed to the microphone. Identify yourself and your media house and then... Okay, go ahead, go ahead. You need... Please bring down the microphone. Thank you. I'm Yaira. Um, I wanted to know 
actually I'm not surprised about this government performance. I'm not surprised at all. And since JM has been there, if he comes back, even though they have destroyed so much, I know he will do well to fix it back. What I wanted to ask Mr. Ginapo is um, concerning the voter region. I learned there, are, there is oil there that they can explore. So I want to know, since he became the energy minister, what were they able to do to know if the exploration there will be successful so that it can boost the region and then give jobs to the youth? Yaira, thank you. Okay, so um, Honorable Boa, you may come forward and begin that. In the meantime, I'd like to inform all of you that we have um, special donation cards of a great NDC just outside the auditorium. There are some pretty ladies there who will be happy to let you have a platinum, gold, silver, or bronze card, so you can go there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency, distinguished guests. Uh, I think I'll take the first question, what we do to attract private investment? And I think it was stated in uh, Honorable Gina Paul's answer. When the NDC took over power and we started the petroleum sector, we started from ground zero. And what we knew was that we needed to make sure that we lay a transparent regulations that will attract private sector investment. And so when he talks about the establishment of the Petroleum Commission done by the NDC, when he talks about the passage of the local content ally, which empowered Ghanaian, in fact, the verdict is out. The Petroleum Commission just announced that from 2014 to quarter three of 2019, Ghanaians and not foreigners, contracts that Ghanaians got because of the local content law that was passed by President Mahama was $1.2 billion. He says that joint venture between Ghanaians and foreigners because of the pioneering leadership and the laws and the regulation we passed was $5.2 billion. You know, this week we were listening to Talo's decision to lay 24% of Ghanaian workers. And I asked myself, who is speaking for Ghanaians? Talo attempted to do that earlier, if you recall. We brought them in. And we ask them a simple question. Where is the resource located? Is it in London or Ghana? If it is in Ghana, you can't cut 24 here and cut 10% in London. Do the opposite. And so we fought in the petroleum sector for Ghanaians. And exactly what we would do. When the petroleum minister, President Nanado's petroleum minister, comes to parliament and attempts to basically erode all the regulations and law that safeguard and attract investment. For example, they came in and he says that the Petroleum Commission was scrutinizing ACA too much. So they are taking the power from the regulator. The only reason why the NDC brought the regulator was to safeguard the interests of Ghana. And the record is that since the establishment of the Petroleum Commission by, uh, by the NDC government, they've saved the country $10 billion in a lot of work that the oil companies want to do and they will challenge them that this is not necessary. And they've done a lot. The estimate was that the Talon wanted to do a lot of drilling, they will stop over $3 billion. And so these are the things that will attract private investment, making sure that, as an oil man asked me recently when I visited Houston, he said, Honorable Bois, you guys were different. The type of things you access to do and the questions you ask us, your friends don't. And I told him, I gave you an answer, we love Ghana. And that's why we are standing here. <laughs> the, other, the other important question that was asked was Esploco. You know, even the Minister of Finance didn't understand why we established Esploco. Because he came to Parliament, I was with my leader. And the leader brought me to try to explain why we established Esploco. And I said, you go across the world, Every national oil company has to establish a commercial arm to basically compete with the private sector so that they can avoid the bureaucracies that we have. That was exactly the reason we established this block. If you want to make your national oil company a competitor and 
a MagSAP reserve and become an operator for the country. You need to prepare the engineers to compete. That's exactly why we established as PLOCO. And they came to parliament, took the 24 uh, percent that we have for Esploco. I can assure you, and I know the president will do that. We will bring back Esploco and strengthen GMPC. Amen. What is GMPC doing today? Their core mandate has been taken away, and now when they talk about GMPC, people are happy about announcing. I listened to the National Youth Organizer so happily talking about, oh, GMPC have built so much toilets and 40 schools. Yes. GMPC must do corporate social responsibility, but their core mandate is to get to the day where Ghana, led by GMPC, will take a block, discover oil, so that we can get a stake. And I'm happy I see some of the local uh, Ghanaian oil players here. You have to take this seriously, because what Nana Akufuadu and his MPP government just did to you with the Ake development, and this was the head block that Ake just took over, they came to parliament. And basically said, Ake is going to embark on a development. His Excellency, the development that you fought to make sure that Ghanaians have a piece of the cake. For example, if uh, ENI was developing five billion, you asked the question, and I remember, how much can Ghanaian businesses get out of this? And that is exactly why when they were even building a PSO in Singapore, you forced them to send Sewell, Hakem, and Osam to get a piece of the contract. This is our country. This is our resources. <laughs> the MPP government, led by President Anadu, is saying that Ake, with a $3 billion development, can just develop everything else that is international. And I ask you a question. What is not international about oil development? Do we have the capacity to build the FPSO in Ghana? And he says that they can do everything there because it's international. And guess what? Because somehow, they can get their own cronies to have a piece of the cake without any tender, to leave Ghanaians who have established. So this is where we are. Basically, the gains we have made, as you listen to the presentation, has all been wiped out. As for free senior high school, every time we've listened to the expenditure on free senior high school, the last time we checked, 400 million. And then we look at the numbers. MPP are very clever because they know that if we are spending the oil money on free senior high school, what is your problem? We wouldn't have a problem if the money was being spent on physical infrastructure, on the things we need. But all that money, can you imagine? Right now, go across the region and ask who is supplying rice and food to the secondary schools in the country. That's Amako Fibua, former energy minister, there speaking at the NDC's uh, policy dialogue series. Uh, this one that's on the state of Ghana's energy sector. Welcome to the polls. 25 years of impact, impactful journalism. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are. We are live from our studios here in Kokomlemle. On digital address, GA 0992539. Our top story is this hour. Former finance minister and former deputy governor of Bank of Ghana charged with falsification of accounts money laundering, fraudulent breach of trust, and willfully causing financial loss to the state. We have the details and seven others who were charged along these two. A national security minister appears in parliament to answer questions over national security policy, which is delaying as minorities seek broader consultation and clarity on who qualifies to be employed as a national security operative. We're live in Parliament with details. Also, security is top of our list this afternoon. We'll tell you the story of Wale Wale, where armed robbers are terrorizing residents, Kumasi, where mysterious deaths are occurring uh, among women, and then to Klagon, where residents suspect a case of missing person is kidnapping. We are live at the police headquarters for some answers as well. Join us on DSTV 41, Go TV 144. On YouTube, we're streaming live. You can send us a WhatsApp message on 0540109009. Right now, I'll take you back to the Swiss Spirit, Alisa, where the NDC's policy dialogue series on the state of Ghana's energy sector is ongoing. We are reprofiling to reduce the cost of servicing the debt. We are paying about 21 billion every year 
to service the debt. Debt servicing is doubled. That is not sustainable. And I'm pleading with those who understand the economy. Please, get interested in these matters. This does not include repayment for ESLA. This does not include repayment for GAT and all those other ones they have decided to take off the balance sheet. This is serious. We can't grow a country that way. And so these are serious issues that we ought to be looking at as a country. And so it's true. You are borrowing $2.4 billion. President Mama says, let's all discuss it. Let's have a sustainable long-term vision, a sustainable way of funding free SHS. That is for Ghanaians to decide. Um, let me thank you very much. Uh, you want to deal with it? Okay. Here, here. There, there was a question on the water. I think that's a very, very important question. One of the things we did was to ensure that we pass Act 919. And because when it comes to the water basin, we are talking about developing uh, oil resources, not offshore, but onshore. And so if you look at, at 191, what is important there is that there's a lot of processes involved, community engagement, getting the community ahead, yes. And so GMPC started a process of engagement and education, and then started a lot of seismic work. That work was taken over by the Petroleum Commission working closely with GMPC. And there's a lot of progress that has been made. I believe that when the NDC government comes, because of the progress that has been made, we need to fast track that process and get to the point where we can sustainably develop the Voltaire basis. But there's a huge potential there. But we need to go with caution and make sure that we can do all the right things. Thank you very much. I am afraid I want to take just a quick break to introduce um, the Honorable Minority Leader. Um, there's some particular issue about the Pualugu Dam that he intends speaking to uh, briefly. So we'll take a pause for the questions. When the Minority Leader is done with that, we will come back and then take two more rounds of questioning and we'll bring it to a close. We appreciate particularly the time of uh, Honorable Members of Parliament who are here with us. President John Dramani Mahama, flag bearer, my colleagues in leadership, this is an energy dialogue series ably led by the Honorable Gina Po and our energy team. I'm responding to just one of those questions, and in it is what will the NDC do to attract private sector investment? in the energy sector. And those of you who listened to President Nanadu Dankwa when he was in Palugu, so it's not just Baumia who is contradicting himself, his boss, he learns it from him, also contradicts himself. And I just give you the phrase, in Palugu, President Nanadu Dankwa stated, and I'm quoting him by paraphrasing, that this is the single most important investment ever in Ghana's history, and that this will be solely funded by the government of Ghana, unquote. He was compelled to contradict himself because those of you who want to read, I'll share a journal with you, African Journal, which has done some analysis of the Sino-Hydro interests in Africa. And it recognizes that under the NDC, and President John Dramani Mahama, the highest foreign direct investment ever in Ghana's history is a Giniami Sankofa field, 5.7 billion. So you know why Nanadu had to contradict himself. If he said it was the highest foreign direct investment, it would be the NDC. So he had to say that this would be funded by government of Ghana to say that this is solely government funded under me have done well. But he has come back to parliament with a loan facility. So that's a contradiction. It is no longer wholly government funded. Because if it is wholly government funded, it's true. It will be the highest ever investment wholly government funded in Palugu, in Upper East Region. But if it is foreign direct investment, he cannot match the reality of the facts on the ground. 
Our beef as a caucus, as the leadership of the Energy Committee has indicated, 366 million US dollars for 60 megawatts of electricity is a complete rip off and padded. And we invite the Ghanaian media to take interest. Ethiopia, Uganda have all built hydropower systems. At least, even their own buoy, buoy dump. You, uh, uh, those of you who are interested in unit costs, buoy dump, if you do my mathematics, is never too good. I was not good in mass. It's 1.9 million US dollars per megawatt of electricity. With Palugu, it will mean $6 million per megawatt. Best practice, as we are told by the Gina Pauls and the Muto Kiel and the Kovna Donkos, is at worst 1.5 million US dollars. So we demand answers. The final one I like to respond to so that I yield the floor to the energy people. The media, be interested in reading the annual report on the petroleum funds. This is 2018. It's the same character for 2019 and 2017. And I'm quoting, I'm quoting just a paragraph for you. Total expenditure on fiscal infrastructure and service delivery in education amounted to 417 million, representing 68.87%. Same words, fiscal infrastructure and service delivery in health amounted to 11.27 million, representing 1.36%. This is what the NDC is talking about. Yes, invest, but the discrepancy, it means our health is no longer important. In one year, you have 876 million invested in fiscal infrastructure in education. Yet, we cannot see the fiscal infrastructure. It goes to consumption. Then for health, you have 74 million. I only can commend the National Communication Officer of the party and the leadership of the party for this opportunity. And to charge other ranking members to live up to their calling on your sector specific to lead the manifesto promise of President John Ramani Mahama. God bless. Okay, so we will now proceed with the questioning and it looks like this is going to be our final round of questioning because um, many people have indicated that they also have to attend to other businesses, particularly for uh, MPs. Um, so may I begin with you, please? Maybe four questions and then it's a wrap. Um, thank you. My name is Nanaya Adjumpa. <clears throat> Sorry, my name is Nanaya Adjumpa and I work with the Class Media Group and I also host the political show Ghana Kassa on CTV. My question is, if it is true, as um, claimed by the Honorable Gina Paul, that $655 million in oil revenues cannot be accounted for and they are missing, with heavyweights like Honorable Mutawakilu, Honorable Kabana Donko, Honorable Kofi Amabua, and Honorable Gina Paul himself, who are members of the NDC energy team in parliament. My question is, what are you doing to salvage the situation in order to ensure that this particular money, $655 million, is accounted for before you assume power next year? Thank you. Thank you, Nana. My name is Yao Enjibo Isiako, Next TV Morning Show host. Uh, I know, uh, Honorable Jinapo, after this presentation, if the MPP is to have any forum, they are going to contradict or say something different from your figures you are bringing out. And we know that they will do that. But my question is, is it about rediscovering oil or getting something beneficial to the nation? I just want to know if the NDC have the opportunity to serve this nation again. In terms of percentage-wise, how well is Ghana going to benefit from our oil? Because we know that what we get now is less. And as a nation, even uh, other companies who are also even bringing their tools and other things to even get the obstruct the oil, oil are even benefiting more than a nation Ghana. So what is the NDC will do when they come in terms of percentage? How well are we going to benefit as a nation? That is my question. Thank you. Yes, please. My name is George Graham. Um, the work of the past and the George, where are you coming from, please, so we can identify you? I'm a private person. Okay, that's correct. Fine. The work of the NDC government in the past 
I mean, of the past NDC regime's government, and with regards to energy, is unparalleled. That is something we cannot dispute. With that, what I want to ask is, what will the next NDC government do differently to reduce the cost of power? Because we know that the cost of power is a very critical factor when it comes to industrialization. How will we redo that? And I'm also asking this because of the fact that when it comes to the export of power, there's that argument out there that the cost of power from Ghana is not competitive, and that is deterring enough. What will the next NDC government do to reduce the cost of power for our industries and for exports? Mr. Thank Graham, you. thank you. Um, yes, sir, I think this may be the final questions, except that we can yield the floor to the CSOs to ask a question or two. My name is Inyo Lochu, a freelance consultant. Honorable Abua said, 25 years from now, what can we account for? for the energy sector, what you are getting from the oil. 10 years past now, my question is, what have we gained? I believe it's a suggestion, oil for industrialization. Currently, we are workforce for the foreigners. All the industries in the country is owned by the foreigners. We work for them, and they take the revenue or the profit away. And then we only become their workforce. I believe. If we can come out of a chapter, oil for industrialization, whereby the oil revenue, the heritage fund is not necessary because you buy, you take your heritage fund, invest it for 1%, 2% per annum in foreign countries. It doesn't help us. So oil for industrialization, let's use the oil to, to establish industries so that these industries shall be owned, one, about 40% for the state, 30% for the community where those industries shall be established. And then the rest of the percentage for the stock and saying for the other investors to come in. By so doing, by 25 years, we can see that by the time the oil is depleted, industries are born out of this oil industry, and it shall help us a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Those industries shall be established. And then the rest of the percentage for the stock and saying for the other investors to come in. By so doing, by 25 years, we can see that by the time the oil is depleted, industries are born out of this oil industry, and it shall help us a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lochu. Um, the CEOs also have a question. Otherwise, we just proceed to answering them and then wrapping up. Thank you. So four questions needing answers, and then it's a wrap. Thank you, Your Excellency. 650 million cannot be accounted for. Yes, we are saying that we cannot account for $650 million because there is a certain architecture for tracing and utilizing oil revenue. That was why we passed the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, so that every single revenue will be tracked. Unfortunately, using the legitimate expenditure framework, we cannot find this money. And raising the issue here is one of the uh, methods available to the minority to whip up national interest. The, our PRMA has been described as one of the best in the sub-region. We've learned from best practices elsewhere and also learned what not to do from the immediate neighborhood. And therefore, we set up the Petroleum Revenue Management Act. Any expenditure outside the provision of the act is illegal, and therefore, the money is missing. I hope that establishes that. The percentage for the benefit of Ghanaians, in terms of what my colleague uh, Jinapo quoted, we, that is only equity. That is only equity. Benefit of an oil system does not only lie in equity, but also in the goods and services, in the skill development, and also in the total contribution 
of the sector to the national economy. Let me give you just one example. Under Act 919, we decided that all oil revenue, even including revenue for our partners, must pass through a central account at Bank of Ghana so that as a people, we can also monitor the disbursement. The Azure Mobile Agreement, we did not sign it in 2016 because that was the bottleneck. Ghana refused, under President John Dramani Mahama, we refused to sign the agreement because Azure Mobile was not comfortable with passing the revenue through the central account in Bank of Ghana, and we said we wouldn't sign. Unfortunately, we lost the election. The, the government of Nana Adodanko Akufuado came, and they waived that clause for them and signed. Most people don't know this, but it's important that we are not only looking at equity. Yes, we were increasing equity holdings, but beyond equity, we were very strict on local content. I had the fortune of pioneering the Petroleum Commission so that even the value chain, we will accumulate the value chain, a larger percentage of the value chain to Ghana. Under the ACA agreement now, they want to use a system of procurement where the Petroleum Commission will not have the teeth to insist on buying made in Ghana or contracting procurement services from Ghanaian entities. So this, when we come back, God willing, in 2021, we will insist that Act 919 is implemented to the full and we will come up with further policies to even enhance the operationalization of the act for the benefit of Ghana. What will we do differently? Or what next will we do when we come? We, there will be a lot of emphasis on efficiency of use. As a people, we are very energy inefficient. We can reduce price of energy, we can reduce our bills, by improving conservation, improving efficiency methods and other terms. When the manifesto comes out, I believe there will be some commitments, so you will know. We will also develop the use of natural gas for a number of processes and factories, residential areas where it can be connected to, there are those plants, and all these are contained in the gas master plan that we put in place. And therefore, there will be a lot of emphasis on efficiency. We are wasting about 30% of power. About 30% of power is wasted. Our commercial and technical losses alone come to about 23%. And therefore, if you generate, and out of every 100, you lose 23% even before you start using it, then we are in trouble. And that is where we are. And then if you add domestic inefficiencies, where we'll plug the iron to iron one kaba, one handkerchief, we are wasting another huge percentage on inefficient use of power. The NDC would work at improving efficiency and also come now with more conservation methods. Before we left office, we had a program to put a lot of public schools on solar, especially our primary, middle schools, JHS in the rural areas. One of the biggest fights we had, we had between the Ministry of Energy, the, the Ministry of Power, and the Ministry of Finance was the cost of paying for power in basic schools. We know our basic schools don't run in the night. And yet the bills for basic schools were huge. We will be putting solar panels, etc., in our primary health facilities, in the chief compounds, etc., and that will reduce the cost of energy. The last one, oil for industrialization. I just, with the permission of leadership, I will say kindly wait and see our manifesto. There is a definite provision for industrialization. In fact, energy as a whole, energy as a whole, 
must help industrialization. We don't need energy for energy's sake. Energy must drive industrialization. And that, is, that will be at the heart of our manifesto. Thank you. Just, just, sorry, just before I take my seat, my leader mentioned briefly Bui. This is the smallest of the four documents on the Balugu Dam. This is the smallest. There are four volumes. This is the solar component. And yet, one, one out of four. And yet, we are being told that a document laid 9 p.m. by 10 p.m., a committee has studied the document, come out with a report within one hour on the night of 23rd December 2019. And this is the smallest of the four components. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I will try to, one of our ladies came out in respect to what Volta region is benefiting from our oil activities. Uh, under President Mama, we approve a petroleum agreement, Swiss Africa, or Woodfield, on the uh, Keta Basin, shallow waters. And we believe that exploratory activities is ongoing. And as a government, President Mama started the Voltaic Basin exploratory activities to gather more data. And I believe by 7th December 2007, when he returns back to power, he will accelerate more data collection in the Voltaic Basin, of which part of Volta is captured. Uh, let me also tell you that somebody said, how can we do to take more stick? From PIAC reports from 2017, 2018, 2019, it is clear that we get much of our revenue from the CAPI that is carried and participating interest. More than 60% of the revenue we derive from our oil comes from carried and participating interest. So when a government start reducing our stake in terms of carried and participating interest, it's a cause for worry. And that is why the reduction of the carried and participating interest from 43% in the AGM to 18% is a, percent, is a cause for worry. And this wasn't done out of the blue by President Mahama. The PNDC law 84 was not fit for purpose. And that is why, as a president, he brought in the Act 919. And in that, carried interest alone is 15%. You can't go below 15%. And this is a president who is bold to ensure that we make maximum use of our oil resources. He made sure that all subsequent petroleum agreement, the fiscal regimes are enhanced. And that is a president. He's not a president who has come to reverse the clock. But President Nanaku Fuadu has come. So far, two agreements, and they are all worse off. ExxonMobil agreement is worse off among all the petroleum agreements that we have signed. And then AGM Ake. So President Mama is the only alternative who will come and ensure that we make maximum use of our oil resources. Then let me also from, I'm not a communication expert, with guidance from the minority leader, I want to put this to the general public. His Excellency Baumia indicated that they will extend Wi-Fi to the universities. Under President Mahama, there was an extension of broadband fiber from to KUST, to University of Ghana, to UDS, and to UHAS. This was a facility from a Norwegian uh, company, Huawei, of about 23 million euros. And to make specific reference, 
that of that of the University of Ghana was supervised by Dr. Bakuba. Dakuba. So ask uh, Dr. Baumia to consult him whether what we are saying is true or false. And we believe that we never lie. And so therefore, he is not. We have laid down the foundation and he must acknowledge receipt of what President Mama has done for the people of Ghana and to the educational sector. Thank you. Thank you um, very much. On behalf of the organizers, the National Democratic Congress, the caucus of a minority in parliament, I'd like to thank all of you sincerely for coming and to grace this um, program, particularly the leader of our party, the former president, the chairman of our party, the functional executive committee, honorable members of parliament, the various speakers, the civil society organizations, invited guests, and everybody who has been here. I'm sure that in due course, you'll hear from us again. Thank you very much. It's a wrap. Thank you.